Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Key Areas Where Information Management is Advancing and Changing, A Look Ahead. I'm Teresa Resick, Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today is AIM's Chief Evangelist, John Mancini, and later during our Q&A, Aaron McCart of ASG Technologies will be joining us also. ASG Technologies is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. As we get started, and you're reading on the screen a little bit about AIM, I just wanted to offer you a few pointers for viewing today's webinar. By joining our webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience. Feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows. And across the bottom of your screen is a list of all of the widgets that are available to you. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list that's to the right side of the slide area. There's also some other links and documents in there to help you learn more about today's topic. Feel free to ask questions throughout the hour using the Q&A feature. We will hold these until the end where we should have about five or ten minutes to answer them. You can also use this feature to comment or ask for technical assistance. At the end of a webinar, a brief survey will open up onto your browser, and we would greatly appreciate it if you take a few moments, offer your feedback, and suggest other topics for us to cover. You can also access this survey um, in the list of widgets across the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's web resources webinars page in just a few days. Um, and right now I'd like to introduce our featured speaker today. Um, John Mancini is here with us, and John is an author. He is a catalyst in social, mobile, cloud, and big data technology adoption, and an advocate for the new generation of experts who are driving the future of information management. John predicts that the next three years will generate more change in the way we deploy enterprise technologies and whom we trust with this task than in the previous two decades. So right now, I'm going to turn things over to John Mancini to begin his discussion today. John? Hi, Teresa, and hi, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting time to be thinking a little bit about um, where content management and information management has, has been and where it's going. Um, I personally, right now, I'm in uh, California at our Executive Leadership Council meeting. And a lot of the issues that we're talking about here today are some of the issues we've been talking about during the meeting. And one concept that came up that I thought was really interesting was this notion of um, generations of technology, that a generation in technology term is defined um, right now as three years. And so um, to put that in perspective in a consumer context, you know, one of the things that um, one of the speakers yesterday talked through was that um, if you have a senior in high school and a senior in college, they really are very different generations of technology, and things are changing that quickly. And so um, that's in the consumer realm. And if you think about this in the uh, content management realm and in the enterprise software realm, um, things are not quite changing that quickly, but, but certainly they are, they are changing a lot. And as I think about this, there's been a couple of galvanizing points um, out there that really have um, focused us in, I think, on thinking about these changes in the space and what are the implications of, this, of those changes, so what are the implications for the people that are trusted with managing information assets within their organization. So when I think about this, you know, certainly the, the purchase um, by um, open text of Documentum, uh, first the sale and then the purchase, you know, that got a lot of people thinking about this question of, you know, where's the space going, what's going on, what's happening with it. And that was kind of one point, I think, that's, um, that's been a healthy point in terms of getting people thinking about this. Second point is that um, the speaker from Gartner yesterday and um, basically made a point that we've been making for some time now, that, you know, this idea of ECM as a definable um, and discernible uh, space um, is really something that maybe is starting to move into a different direction. Um, we've been talking about it in terms of the shift of content and content management defined in terms of technologies from content and content management defined in terms of the applications that it serves. 
Um, we've been talking a lot about content services, and actually Gartner reinforced that yesterday in their presentation in which they talked about that um, they are retiring the term ECM. It doesn't mean that it's going away. It doesn't mean that the competencies are going away. It doesn't mean that the systems are going away. But they're going to start to talk about this space in terms of um, what they call content services. And I think that's a good jumping off point to think about how did we get to that point? You know, how did we wind up where we are right now? And what are the implications of that for people that are managing information systems within organizations? So the way I usually like to think about this, a lot of people come up to me and they say, oh, goodness, Mancini, um, AIM has been around since 1943. Um, we were started as the National Microfilm Association. And what on earth is the connecting tissue in that story? You know, how does an organization that was started uh, focused on microfilm, you know, remain relevant and talking about content and information management today? And I think... I think the core thing is that, you know, really this journey is not about just technology. So I like to think about the three triads, if you will, the three legs of the stool, which are, which are people, process, and technology. And certainly the technology realm is changing and changing um, even more rapidly than it ever did before. But when you put these things together, they represent uh, essentially information management. And what does it mean to manage information in a way that reflects the changes that are going on in our business processes, the changes that are going on in the underlying technologies, and the changes that are going on in the way that people use technology. And so when you think about this, I, uh, reflecting, I've been at AIM for 20 years, that um, you know, I think in the last three, uh, uh, 20 years in particular, we've been through three distinct eras. And I think they're useful to just spend a few minutes um, talking about those three eras, what was characteristic of them, as a jumping off point to thinking about what happens next and where are things changing. So the first thing, when I first came to AIM, um, we spent a lot of time in this industry, if you will, that we call document management and workflow. And so if you think about my triad of people, process, and technology, and think about what the characteristic elements were during that period, you know, if you start with process, you know, when this industry got started, you know, it was really focused about the question of automating documents in the context of um, document-intensive, complicated, mission-critical processes. And so the implications of that were that the implementations tended to be very complex, they tended to be custom, they tended to be expensive. You know, the poster child for document management in Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm book was the whole question of new drug applications and how this technology helped facilitate that. You know, well, that's a mission-critical, large company, um, Fortune 500 um, kind of an implementation. And the business bought that because it wanted competitive advantage. On the people side, a very, very tiny fraction of the people in our organizations touched these systems, only the people that were responsible for those particular processes. And so usability wasn't really that much of a concern. Um, if the solutions were hard to use, then, you know, that was fine. We were willing to train people in order to execute against those mission-critical processes. And that was really what was characteristic of the document management and workflow era. You know, we went from there into about the year 2000 into the enterprise content management realm. And in that realm, when you start thinking about business processes, you know, we started to think about content as, as a layer um, in the organization that was essentially owned by IT. And it was a set of technology services that basically were designed to support multiple processes. Now, there were a couple of challenges along the way there as we started to think about that. One is that the systems continued to be sold on a departmental basis. And so the legacy of that is that most organizations at any scale wound up not with this nirvana of one content management repository in which all content resided, but, you know, multiple repositories. And, and that was changed. Um, and, and accelerated by the entry of SharePoint into the marketplace, you know, which really changed this whole question of the centrality of where information is located. It also pushed the industry in the direction of knowledge workers. And then the enterprise file sync and share players came in, um, led by Box, in about 2010. And that further this, furthered this shift 
from an ECM industry that was centered on specialists to one that was starting to be redesigned around knowledge workers. So that gets into the current era, which I just characterize as mobile and cloud. And this is a particularly disruptive era. Um, and it's disruptive because when you think about the impact that the Salesforce revolution had, in other words, being able to buy enterprise solutions in the cloud, buy the drink, um, and purchasable by the business, often with minimal IT investment, and then also followed that with a shifting of resources in the direction of the business, you know, he started moving down a path of some extreme balkanization in terms of content resources. You know, he started on the technology side also to shift in a direction in which configuration and connection and mobile skills became very important. You know, we really changed the game on what security was all about. You know, we used to think that if we set up a high enough wall at the firewall and we kept the barbarians out, um, that we'd be pretty much okay. Well, mobile devices really changed that, um, that whole equation very, very dramatically. And we had to start to think about managing information assets rather than just perimeter-based security. And then the real revolution occurred on the people side. You know, because all of a sudden, you know, this was a toolkit that was used by most of our knowledge workers. Um, so that created a premium on usability. Um, and on top of that, you wound up with the impact of the consumer revolution, which is, you know, if you're a knowledge worker and, you know, your central IT department doesn't deliver the kinds of solutions that you feel you need in order to work collaboratively with your peers, odds are there's a consumer solution you can kind of bolt together and use. And, you know, while that helps, helps the business move forward, it doesn't really help from the perspective of managing risk in the organization and also managing information value across silos in the organization. So you wound up with this very, very different stew in the last um, three or four years. Now, the, the implications of this, I think, are fairly profound as you start to think about these three areas and how they connect together. Um, the first thing is that, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of technology generations, these eras are coming at us faster and faster. And so, you know, if, think we, if we think we've had a hard time keeping up up until now, um, it's about to get even more challenging moving forward. So that's, you know, point one. Point two is that um, sometimes it's hard to figure out where this is all going. Um, but given that there's a lag often in the adoption of technologies at the enterprise level versus the consumer level, you know, we can really start to get a feel for what we're going to have to deal with in the next, you know, two, three years by looking at what's going on in the consumer realm. And so we do have little warning signs, if you will, that we can look at and, and try to figure out the implications. You know, the latest one in the financial community that I look at, I look at the, at the adoption and the spread of blockchain technologies, for example, and start to think about that. That's a really fundamental thing that I think if we look out ahead two, three, four years, those are some of the technologies we're going to have to deal with in our organizations at the enterprise level. Last piece, I think, as you start to think about this, and this is a real challenging um, rub for information professionals, is that uh, successive eras don't replace what came before. They're stacked on top of what came previously. And so that's a really challenging um, environment for people that are charged with the stewardship of their information assets. You know, because, you know, while a um, disruptive player comes into your business, and doesn't really carry with them all of the legacy issues that um, most people in our space have. Um, you can't just rip out legacy systems that are designed to sustain mission-critical applications. It doesn't work that way at large scale. And so you've got this challenge of, you know, most organizations have some systems that were designed and implemented, and they've been updated, but designed and implemented during the document management and workflow era. Others have you know, additions that were made during the ECM era, and still others have made additions um, along the way, particularly in the collaborative area in the mobile and cloud era. And 
organizations have to figure out how they connect those dots, how do they manage all those things. Uh, it's kind of a walk and chew gum at the same time kind of exercise that I think most organizations have to deal with right now. So it's a particularly challenging environment uh, for information professionals as they, as they deal with this moving forward. And I think about this in the context of business processes, uh, you know, and how challenging this is. And one example I like to use in terms of thinking about um, process disruption and, you know, why this is so hard for people in our space right now. Think about, you know, the process and the costs involved in check depositing. And so, you know, check processing was always, you know, a meat and potatoes kind of application within the content management space, particularly in the document management and workflow era. Well, if you're dealing with teller-facilitated um, transactions and deposits, you know, basically the cost point is 65 cents per transaction. Well, you shift into the ATM era, and that's eight cents. And you shift into the mobile era, in which people are depositing checks on their phones, and the cost per deposit is three cents. And so you've got a very challenging mix where incumbents you know, have to manage um, activity and processes across all three. Um, often disruptive players come in um, solely at the three cent price point and then build scale and then expand into other areas. And so how do you manage that disruption? How do you think about you know, what game you're trying to play and what's the role of information management in the game that you are trying to play becomes particularly problematic. So as you think about this, um, you know, I, in terms of thinking about how content management is changing, I thought I would highlight um, seven key things as just maybe a roadmap, if you will, for some of the things to keep an eye on um, as you move forward, some of the things that you ought to incorporate into your strategy, some of the things you ought to think about along the way. And I thought I would do so by illustrating it mostly with some data points from our industry watch surveys. And uh, so if you haven't taken a look at those, they're a really good benchmarking source to you know, get a real sense. We do about one a quarter of them. Um, and it'll give you some data points just to think about in terms of how content management is changing and what are the implications of those changes moving forward. So the first point that I wanted to touch on, and we've all known this for, for a long time, um, and um, I had somebody that tweeted about this, and I thought it was a really good point. I said, you know, we've woke, awoken from the dream of a single repository. And the person on Twitter said, you know, was it really a dream and, or was it a nightmare? And I think, I think maybe that idea that seemed to circulate that, you know, ultimately everything would wind up in a single repository really was a, a big source of um, distraction and frustration along the way because that isn't how this evolved. This isn't how this emerged. This isn't the practical existence that most organizations have to deal with um, in their day-to-day -day life when it comes to managing information. In our data, you can kind of see it here, you know, 52% have three or more um, systems, um, and that's, that's way understating it. You know, 22% say they have five or more. Um, you think about the, the number of SharePoint instances that most organizations have. You know, you have a really, really balkanized information um, repository structure in most organizations. You kind of add to that um, some of the points that I made earlier, particularly in terms of Gartner's movement away from ECM as a definitive term. And I think, you know, what, what you know, we touched on this, you know, going back as, as long ago as two or three years we started picking this up. You know, I think most organizations need to manage a collection of content services that fuel their business processes. And you know, the idea that all of this is going to wind up in one place just isn't a reality. Um, you still have people trying to do it. Um, my personal opinion, you can see this 52% of organizations are working towards a company-wide ECM capability. Um, but you also see that huge gap. Only 14% have completed it. And I think it's in some ways an, a, um, a false goal. I don't think this is what's going to happen in most organizations, and I don't think it's a practical way of thinking about the problems moving forward. So my first um, key change, if you will, is this idea that users would live in a specific um, repository. And I think as I talk to end users and talk about some of the things that they're looking for from their content management vendors, you know, they're, look, they're basically looking for systems and approaches that reflect the fact that users demand content transparency. 
you know, they don't really care which repository it is uh, it's in. They want to have access to it in the context of their business. So that's kind of point one. So change number two, just to think about. Um, and, you know, this seems obvious now, um, but it really hasn't been that obvious in terms of the changeability of content management systems to reflect um, end user needs. Um, you know, when we talk to people um, in our surveys, and these are folks that have adopted ECM solutions, and when we go back and ask them, you know, how are things going, you see data points like this. 22% consider that their ECM project to be somewhat stalled. 21% have adoption issues. Um, this data point is one of the biggest bummer data points, I think, in my time at AIM. 52% say they're still dependent on their network file shares. You know, only 22% report that they have mobile access to um, their content and records management content. Um, and that's not necessarily um, the kind of very nicely designed app content that we're used to. Um, often it's, you know, just a web interface with, um, that's not responsive and, you know, isn't really what I would think of as mobile access in the purest form of the, world, of the term. So, so we're at, we've, we've gotten to a point where um, we have to face the fact that systems need to change, approaches need to change, design needs to change, um, such that it is more reflective of the end user. And it all begins there. And so that gets me to my second big point, is that this business, if you will, um, over the course of most of the 2000s was driven by IT and specialists. And this business now is being driven by end users and the business. And that will continue to accelerate moving forward. So that's kind of point number two along the way. Point number three um, is that this compliance thing is, you know, we'd, we'd like to wish that it would go away, um, but it's not and it's getting more difficult over time. And, you know, when you think about the explosion of information that we have to manage, when you think about that sprawl that we all have to manage, um, and when you think about how national governments respond to that sprawl, um, it's getting more complicated rather than less. And so you see data points, for example, in our survey, 51% have data-related incidents. Um, 45 say that, that their lack of information governance leaves their organization open to risks. Um, very few have adopted enterprise-wide strategies to deal with this. And, um, you know, when you get into, when you get pushed into a corner in a discovery situation, you know, 50% um, rely on manual approaches. So, uh, you know, and I think about this particularly in the, in the context of um, the new um, European regulations. Uh, if you haven't, if you do business in Europe, even if you don't have a physical nexus in Europe, you ought to be looking at the GDPR, which goes into um, effect in May of 2018 in terms of a whole set of new requirements related to how in organizations need to manage the information about their customers and with very, very significant penalties for violation. And that's just a, just a, you know, one example of hundreds of instances in which compliance is getting more complicated and more challenging. And I think we have to figure out how we automate as much of that as possible. Um, and that, I think, requires a different way of thinking about it moving forward. So that brings me to my third point, which is that, you know, we traditionally have thought of compliance as, you know, kind of a point-based kind of thing, you know, process X, how do I get that process compliant? I'm not going to really worry about this in a broader context across the organization, but it will be like point by point by point. Um, but that's getting more and more difficult to do. You know, the risks are everywhere. They're becoming more complex, and they require automation if you're going to get any progress in dealing with them. So the fourth change that I wanted to talk about is that, um, you know, the, the future is definitely going to be cloudy. Um, and I mean that a little bit tongue-in-cheek because, um, you know, even organizations that, that, you know, raise their right hand and say, you know, there is no way that we'd ever uh, put any mission-critical um, business into the cloud, um, they still want that option out there. And so, and so what you see is a realization on the part of practitioners, this 87% on the slide of our survey participants are positive about um, the implications of moving to the cloud. They think their organizations are somewhat more skeptical. Um, but the fact remains is that um, 
organizations need to have cloud as part of their strategy. If not right now, then at least have it as an option. And organizations are realizing that you know, there are so many different flavors and multiples of the cloud. Um, you know, there are public clouds and private clouds and hybrid clouds and just about everything in between. And they're also realizing that, you know, cost isn't necessarily the reason to go to the cloud. Lots of cloud-based solutions become just as costly as on-prem when you start to get to massive scale. Um, but they are a path, um, given what's happened in terms of the cost structure of the cloud as a result of things like Amazon um, Web Services and stuff like that. Um, they are a key to rapid deployment and greater business agility. And so, you know, having the cloud as part of your um, equation, if you will, is increasingly important. And so, you know, the way I like to view this is that, you know, people viewed this um, initially as, you know, something that, you know, maybe they'd want to do. You know, now people are really looking at this closely. Um, and it really has implications in terms of enterprise applications. And so you think about this in terms of the revolution that Salesforce put in motion. And, you know, that revolution, you know, when it comes to the ability to buy point processes um, by the drink in very sophisticated applications um, and that you pay for that, um, not by paying everything up front, but you pay for that as you consume it, um, is a very, very attractive model. Now, I think it has enormous consequences and challenges for information stewards in our organization. Because if we think we had a silo problem when we were dealing with on-premise repositories that were process specific, you know, try thinking about this when a lot of the business processes wind up being SaaS based and the content associated with those processes is locked up in the process application that you don't even have on site. It gets really, really complicated if you start to think about that. But it's a fact of life, and the business is driving it, and you know we resist it, um, I think, in some measure at our peril. So next one, number five that I'd like to talk about is, um, you know, we, we've kind of moved as an industry um, from, from a focus really, I guess I would call it from content storage to content insight. And what I mean by that is that there was a big period in this industry in which, you know, we were pretty much content, you know, if we could just get rid of the paper, if we could just get that so that we could find those documents in some sort of an intelligent way um, and we could store them in a way that made sense and when they were more accessible and more available and more manageable, that we'd be happy with that. And I think, you know, where organizations are going right now is, you know, that's not really enough. Um, you know, they're trying to think about, okay, um, how do I take all that data that I have? How do I take all that content that I have and um, apply tools to it so that I can extract um, business insight out of those tools? And that insight can you know, lead to things like automating governance procedures. It can lead to insights that structure um, consumer journeys along the way. But I think the, the main point here is that Organizations are demanding more from their content systems than they ever have before, and they're demanding that they deliver um, not only risk reduction and not only cost reduction, but also they create value. And I think that's a big change along the way and something I think that many organizations haven't dealt with. I think it's a really interesting time, I'll, I'll, just as a sidebar on AIM, you know, I, it, it's fascinating to me that you know, at the same time that I get questions um, tied to this, you know, which are essentially pretty sophisticated questions trying to push the envelope in terms of content implementations out there, um, I also get simultaneously get a lot of questions of, you know, um, how does OCR work? Is OCR trustworthy? Um, how do you, you know, adopt scanning procedures? So, so there's, a, you know, in other words, a real, um, what I would consider kind of content management 101 um, kind of mindset out there too. So that's a, that's a huge challenge. And, and I think one of the challenges that vendors have is that clearly one size doesn't fit all in terms of trying to figure out how do you help organizations automate and how do you help organizations move forward because they are at very, very different starting points. And I think that is something that not only the industry but also AIM has to be cognizant of moving forward. 
the uh, and that manifests itself in that you know we've gone from a focus on collecting data and information to operationalizing that data and information. So the sixth thing is that um, we and this this set of data points was actually um, this morning from the from the Gartner folks in terms of this balkanization and democratization of content creation and. And I think this requires a real fundamental shift in how we think about content, how we think about how we create it, how we use it. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that um, content is being created in ways that we didn't really ever anticipate when some of the original content management systems were put into place. It's much more ad hoc. It's much more um, fragmented. And, and so that has to be reflected, I think, in our strategies because you know, trying to figure out how you deal with collaborative-based content created by geographically dispersed knowledge workers is a very, very different use case than how do you try to automate um, thousands and thousands of insurance forms, for example. And so you know, that, that, that's kind of a dichotomy that we have to be cognizant of moving forward. And that manifests itself in my sixth point here, is that you know, I think many organizations have viewed content management as something that has to start with a massive migration project. And I think organizations moving forward, you know, are really the future is really more in starting small, starting adaptable, starting agile, creating business value, creating business opportunities, and then scaling. And that's a very different way. And I think it's reflective of the fact that content itself is being created in a much more democratized and balkanized way than it ever was before. And so that brings me to my last point that I wanted to touch on, is that, um, is that we really have gone through a shift in um, how we view enterprise um, solutions. And, and a lot of that has been driven by the consumer experience of dealing with mobile apps. And that's not to say that a mobile app is the same as an enterprise solution. I know that the, the two are, you know, the latter is much more complicated than the former. But there's been a, a learning curve that we've taken away from our experience with apps that is carrying over to how we think about enterprise solutions. And so, you know, some of the, and that got me thinking about this question of, you know, well, what is different about mobile apps? And, and certainly, you know, my experience, and I think most people's experience with apps on their phone is very different than what we thought it would be five years ago. You know, when we thought five years ago, I think we thought that, well, we, you know, we'd have to uh, integrate all these apps, you know, that people would never put up with multiple sign-ons, that people would never put up with, you know, very, very narrowly, um, narrowly defined applications um, dealing with particular um, functions. And the reality is, is that, um, We've evolved into into kind of liking having a lot of choices and of like having a lot of options, and that's I think an expectation that carries over into how we think about deploying um, enterprise process solutions. Um, these things are always portable and um, and they're always mobile. They're always on. They're always with us. Um, we like that. Um, we like the idea of self service that um, that these things are vetted, um, and we also like the fact when we deal with apps that um, usability and design is at the top of the list and that um, they tend to do one thing and they do tend to do it really well. And, you know, while that, you know, initially might have been viewed as a bug, um, it's viewed as a, as, a, as a benefit now. And I think some of that is carrying over into how we think about our process applications out there. And I think that, you know, the main thing with regards to all this is that, you know, we want the things that we use to be everywhere. We want it to be device independent. We want to be able to seamlessly go from our phone to our tablets to our laptops um, and, you know, uh, and around and back and be able to use the things that we use um, everywhere regardless of device or location. And that expectation that was created within the app world is really, really carrying over now into the enterprise world and the challenges associated with how you think about and conceive and develop and deploy um, applications that your employees are going to use. So that translates into my last little bullet point here, which is that you know we have thought of this historically, in, um, and it follows on to the previous point about massive migrations. We've thought about this in the past in terms of very big bang, boil the ocean kinds of deployments. 
And I think where we're moving towards now is um, a much more modular approach to content development and to process development, um, more app-like. Um, and you know that doesn't necessarily mean just mobile apps, but it means application-specific um, processes that are constructed on a consistent content foundation and a consistent content strategy, but that are deployed in much more modular fashion than we ever have before. And I think that's the last point that I want to touch on. So with that, um, I will turn it back over to Teresa. I think that this is um, an incredibly exciting time um, for content management. I think about this in the terms of the Gartner announcement. You know, some people would say, oh, geez, if they're retiring the term, you know, ECM, does that mean that um, something uh, fundamentally disturbing is going on? And I don't think that's really the case, and I don't think that's what Gartner meant by uh, retiring the term. I think what they meant is that the term is no longer sufficient to really capture all of the opportunities that content represents and that you know, by viewing this more as a set of content services that empower and enable core business applications and customer engagements, it's a much more constructive way and expansive way of thinking about the space. So net-net is that i um, very excited about the space, very excited about what content management means, and very excited about what that means in terms of our business processes moving forward. So, Teresa, let me hand it back to you. Why, thank you. And, um, and we have been listening to John Mancini, uh, our Chief Evangelist here at AIM. And before we get into the questions and also to give John a chance to catch his breath, I do want to introduce our underwriter, um, ASG Technologies. And Aaron McCart from ASG is joining us here. And Aaron is a Solutions and Product Marketing Manager at ASG Technologies. So, Aaron, welcome. Thank you very much. I uh, just wanted to give you an opportunity just to share with us a little bit right now, um, just briefly, who is ASG Technologies? ASG Technologies uh, is a company that's been around for about 25 to 30 plus years. We focus in three primary areas, uh, service and infrastructure management uh, for distributed and mainframe systems, um, data intelligence, and also enterprise content management, or as John alluded to, content services. Um, in the area of content services, our product line is Mobius in Cyprus, and we service uh, companies in the uh, Fortune 500, uh, Global 1000, primarily in financial services, banking, insurance, manufacturing, and retail. Well, thank you for that, that uh, uh, very concise overview. And um, just wanted to... Uh, start more of this um, as I'm you know, going through the questions, and John, I'm sure you're going through the questions too. Aaron, I just want to give you the opportunity to, to head off uh, the, our, our joint Q&A talk here. Um, with all the different things that John was sharing, um, what similarities are you seeing within your customer base, or what were the things that were jumping out to you with what John was sharing that is most applicable for, for what your customers are going through? Well, John brought up a lot of very good points of how the industry or the market for content management is changing. Many of our early adopter um, customers are coming to us and saying, hey, you know, we have five, six, seven deployments of content management uh, systems throughout the organization. Um, we are no longer able to manage those different systems in all the various departments. We now need to rationalize those. And so they're coming to us and saying, you know, how can we do that? We really like the Mobius product line itself and what it's doing for us from a transactional content management perspective, um, but we just can't support everything. And so... With that, they also say, oh, by the way, we want to move to the cloud now. And so that brings up a whole other dynamic of, okay, now they need to rationalize, re reduce the number of vendors that they have, but also now be able to manage um, the content in the cloud or capture that information. The reason why they want to do that is because they want the content transparency and delivery of that content. Um, that's first and foremost for their business users because the business users now are younger and they really just want access to it from any device that they're using at that time. They don't want to be uh, sitting behind a desktop, behind a firewall in a corporate campus only able to access the work that they need at that time. Also, IT is really saying part of this uh, rationalization is to reduce the IT infrastructure and costs that are associated with managing all these different systems um, and trying to re also reduce the staff count to manage all these different systems. So that plays a large role into it. 
IT also recognizes, as John mentioned from uh, the GDPR, compliance is still a huge issue. It's something that needs to be managed. And fortunately, IT is really expected to do that alongside with uh, the business uh, services individuals. And so they say to, they come to us and say, we're going to put everything in the cloud, or what, really, we're going to put a lot of things in the cloud, but those most critical, important documents that we have to maintain and be able to show proof that we have ownership of those and be able to turn over to the auditors, we really want to keep those on premise. And oh, by the way, we want to be able to share the information between the cloud and on-premise, so they really want a true hybrid environment. Um, so now we're seeing that change occur uh, within the organization themselves. Um, and it, obviously, it really comes down to this fast response to the business needs. Now, IT is no longer really just dictating to the business users what they are able to use and how to access content, but working more in tandem with the business users to be able to provide them what they really need to be successful and make the whole business successful. So our early adopters are really moving in that direction, and as they started getting implemented and started getting um, uh, uh, going on those types of, of new systems, we're seeing our secondary customers come up and new companies coming to us saying, hey, can you do that for us too? Good points. Thank you, Aaron. Um, John, I wanted to uh, move this next question over to you because a couple of people are asking it. Um, do you have any thoughts or speculation you know, with, with Gartner retiring the um, enterprise content management ECM term? Are you seeing any new terms stepping up as being th the descriptor for what this industry is? Or um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I think the um, um, – I, 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 won't speak for Gartner, but I think Gartner's calling it content services, and they have um, um, kind of a, um, a longer explanation of what they mean by that term. And um, be happy to um, send that around in kind of the follow-up. You can uh, take a look at that and uh, and reflect upon it. Um, but I think it, it it you know it it really reflects the fact that that I think content management is is moving from something that um, I, I heard Toby Bell, former Gartner analyst, um, speak a couple days ago, and he was he was saying that content management has always had like this DIY kind of tool set mentality, and so um, you know, in other words, it, we've always had this idea that it has these constituent technology building blocks, and that you know you need to understand ECM and records management, information governance, and taxonomy and metadata, and you know so on and so on. Um, and, and, it, and it had this like toolkit kind of idea, and that we seem to be moving into um, an environment in which the industry itself is being redefined around the processes that content management helps to automate. So, you know, whether it's dealing with customers or whether it's, you know, customer journey mapping, mapping or, um, you know, loan application process, but it's it's being defined in terms of the process itself, and then content is the thing that helps enable it, and it's not just restricted to content. It also often has a data component to it. It has um, a BI component to it. It has a content component to it. It might have a CRM component to it, and so I think the... Um, we're getting we're moving towards an environment in which we have a much more expansive and process specific view that content is a part of that view, not the totality of that view. Okay. Um, someone is asking here and um Aaron, I, I, it's Aaron McCart from ASG who has also joined us. Uh, someone was asking again for the name of who um, is speaking on behalf of ASG, and that is Aaron McCart. Um, another question that has come in here, and I would actually like to get both of your inputs on, on this, um, because in with how uh, ECM is advancing and moving towards content services, someone is asking in here about um, you know, what are your, your views of how content services fits with concepts of data or information governance, um, you know, the changes in IT and RIM organizations, you know, what would you expect for an org to be successful? I guess on my side, I'll just kind of kick it off. I thought um, Aaron's point about um, multiple repositories, multiple information sources, um, increasing volumes of information coming in to the organization. Um, you know, the net, net of all that is that you've got to adopt an approach that emphasizes automation as much as you can. Um, I think you have to emphasize an approach that emphasizes big buckets as much as you can. 
Um, and I think you have to adopt, at least for me, I think you have to adopt an approach that is much, much more focused around um, risk management rather than necessarily um, kind of um, very firm concepts about how much we used to be able to control. So, uh, and what I mean by that is that, you know, there's a tendency sometimes to, for organizations to think that they have to have a perfect information governance infrastructure, a perfect records management um, structure. And if that was ever possible, it's only possible when the amount of information is pretty modest coming into an organization. And I think now, um, I think those disciplines need to morph to become much more part of an organization's risk calculation because organizations have different risk calculations and I think they've got to reflect that in how they approach questions of governance. Um, but the core thing is that they have to automate as much of this as possible um, because otherwise they'll drown. And, Aaron, you're and I'll, I'll echo what John's saying. You, you, yeah, you definitely have to automate um, because leaving it up to individuals to be able to manage the process itself around governance will lead to failure and lead to risk exposure. And that's just due to the nature of human error um, or communication not occurring uh, throughout the organization as necessary and to be able to make sure that the changes occur to manage the information according to the governance rules gets applied. By automating that, you're now able to automatically apply that to the content that you have within the area you have it and let the systems be able to manage that and, oh, by the way, alert you if there is a challenge or if there is an issue and let you go in and now mediate that issue and fix it um, rather than have to wait for a compelling event to say, oh, we need to fix this now because now we're at risk and we're exposed and our brand may be injured because of it. Okay. Um, while we're sitting here just going, you know, digesting through, um, oh, wait. Another question that's popped in here. Um, any thoughts about leveraging tacit knowledge, uh, maybe opportunities to leverage the convergence of the content services, the process, and the unrecorded knowledge, you know, such as the expertise, the unwritten rules, things like that? It's, it's, it's interesting, uh, you know, that I think maybe underlying that question is, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, the whole question of knowledge management. And, um, and it's actually interesting, we were talking about this yesterday. Um, it, it, it's really unfortunate that we um, uh, everybody screwed up the use of the term knowledge management uh, 10, 15 years ago before it was really um, ready because it's it's really a concept that's very germane to organizations right now. And we do have finally the tools for people to um, you know connect in a very meaningful way to build up the the um, the intelligence basically of an organization and to automate the way in which that information and knowledge is processed. And so I think there's a resurgence of interest in that. Um, it certainly becomes important as the baby boomers retire because an awful lot of that knowledge is not um, codified within organizations. And so capturing that tacit knowledge, um, if for no other reason um, that we need to uh, 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 you know, guarantee the sustainability of our businesses as all those people retire, I think becomes um, really important. Aaron, any thoughts that you wanted to add to that? I, I think it, as John said, it really comes down to the organizations they have and that information, if it's not being captured, if it's not being uh, collected and be repurposed and being used within the organization, then you're really you're doing yourself a, a great disservice. Uh, we can't always rely on individuals, especially with the amount of people who are moving between organizations and changing organizations and the level of retirement that is occurring. So if you don't capture that tacit knowledge, you're going to lose it forever, and that may really hurt an organization in the long run. Thanks. Thanks. Um, just want to take a moment here and just mention a few other things here. Um, just invite you to check out the variety of training offerings that, that AIM has. And there is a link in the resources list uh, to take you over to the AIM training page. Um, and it, could we offer a variety of in-person, online, and uh, custom programs to meet your needs. And so uh, just invite you to check that out. And if you'd just like some in-depth learning on the, the variety of informa man information management topics, um, that we that there's a lot out there that we offer. So just encourage you to check that out and consider some um, additional education and learning in here.
and very pleased to take a moment here to talk about uh, the next AIM conference. AIM 17 is coming up in Orlando, Florida, uh, and that's coming uh, very soon in March. And I know we have some exciting keynote speakers lined up. And, and John, just wanted to touch base with you because I know you've been um, working closely with our events team uh, for the folks who are working to prepare the content on here. I just wanted to give you the chance to share with others about uh, what's coming up at AIM 17. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I think that little picture you have on there on the screen is um, is actually me up there, that little tiny thing um, from last year. Um, it's it's a great conference. I, I, we're really proud of what we've been able to um, pull off with the conference. Those of you guys that might have been around the space for a long time might remember the old AIM show. Um, this doesn't really have anything to do with that experience. Um, that was a great experience while we had it. Um, but you know the big trade show thing lived its day. Um, we sold it in 2002. Um, about you know we were in a non-compete situation for about 10 years after that, um, and then about four or five years ago we started to think you know um, this this profession of information professionals needs a place where people can gather, where they can think about the challenges that are going they're going to face in the short um, future. So in the next like 18 to 24 months, think about those challenges, um, have presentations that focus on how people have solved those problems and how they're thinking about those problems, and um, create a different kind of a conference experience that's much more engage engaging and um, interactive for the participant. And it's actually designed for the participant rather than for the, um, for the vendors. So we don't have a trade show floor. We have a solutions lounge that has... Uh, everybody on a level playing field, um, and the real focus is on encouraging interactions amongst the um, participants. And so we're, uh, um, I love the event. It's, uh, as you can probably tell, it's, um, it's really terrific. We're very proud of it. Um, it's at a, um, a size point where relationships are possible. Um, we try to keep it at about 800 participants. So if you're looking for a really good place to um, spend, I know, those very, very rare um, training and professional development dollars next year, um, it's a good place. I can pretty much guarantee that you'll have a good time and you'll learn a lot and make a lot of connections that will be helpful. Yeah, and, and I'm just looking it up very quickly. I, uh, some of the presenters who are going to be there are from Columbia University, from Gartner, from Houston Airport, from Manulife. New York Presbyterian, uh, Wells Fargo. So there's a lot of really good industries that will be represented for sharing their stories. Um, so I invite you to go to the, the website, aimconference.com, and just to get more information um, and look forward to seeing you at the event. Yep. And uh, just as we are getting to the end of our webinar hour, just want to remind you that we are recording this webinar, and it is going to be available in the next day or two at the at AIMS Resources Webinars page. Um, and also when the webinar is over, a brief survey is going to open up on your desktop. And, and again, I do value your feedback, and we greatly appreciate hearing from you. Very much want to thank our underwriter of today's event, ASG Technologies. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs. So thank you, ASG Technologies. Um, your your support, support is valued and, and greatly appreciated. So just as we do come to the end of this webinar, um, I do want to ask each of our speakers for their closing thought or key takeaway from today. So I'd like to start first with Aaron McCart from ASG. Your closing thoughts today. My closing thoughts really come down to as you look at what you currently have from a content management perspective within your organization, take a close look at that and think about where you want to be um, with managing that content, having the ability to have content transparency, be able to manage content in both cloud and on-premise, um, be able to manage content from a, a compliance standpoint, and then really sit back and figure out what's going to work best for your organization because every type of content management system or services is going to be different. And think about the applications you need, the automation that you need to have within your organization, and start developing that roadmap to where you can get to in the next two to five years. Uh, if you do that, you'll be very successful. Thank you, Aaron. And John Mancini from AIM, your closing thoughts today. I think I'd just like to leave with one thing, which is, you know, reflects back again on that um, um, Gartner report uh, this week, retiring the uh, ECM term. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, you kind of think like, oh, is it the, uh, the end of the era? I'm always a half, uh, half full kind of person. So I think it's really actually the beginning of an era. And I, 
And I mean that really seriously because I think one of the challenges that we've had in the ECM community, and when I talk to people that sell these solutions, um, as well as people that buy them, particularly when I talk to people that sell them, and I say, well, you know, um, you didn't get that piece of business. Um, who did you lose out to? Who, who did you compete with that you didn't get the business? And almost always they don't cite another competitor. Um, they basically say that the, the organization decided um, not now, we'll get to it someday, you know, maybe we'll wait till a little bit later, um, you know, kind of none of the above sort of thing. And I think what's going on right now is that as organizations struggle with um, digital disruption and they struggle with the need to convert their businesses to digital businesses no matter what they're in, content becomes an even more central role. And so I think moving forward, we're going to be very surprised is that some of the resistance that we've seen to content management technologies are going to evaporate as people realize that they are critical to solving the digital business issue. Thank you, John. Um, so on that note, I'm going to wrap things up. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. For AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we'll see you next time. Have a great afternoon.